Hello, everybody, and welcome to the New York Public Library. My name is Martha Hodes. I'm interim director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the library, stepping in for director Salvatore Schibona, who's on fellowship leave for the next two years. This evening, we continue our fantastic fall program of conversations from the Coleman Center, a collaboration with Live from NYPL, featuring two brilliant writers. Coleman fellow Uwen Akpan will discuss his new novel, New York, My Village, in conversation with Cullen, Coleman fellow Elif Batuman. You may know that the Coleman Center selects 15 fellows each year for a nine month term. The program was founded in 1999 and to date we've supported the work of more than 300 fellows. Our fellows receive an office in the center and a living stipend so they can focus exclusively on their work. They come to the library to gain intensive access to our unparalleled collections in order to write the books of tomorrow. Our fellows are among the best and most promising, academics and independent scholars, fiction writers and poets, journalists, translators, playwrights, dramatists and artists at work today. Writers and scholars from any country are welcome to apply and the application for the next cycle will be available in June on our website. Our next round of conversations from the Coleman Center will pick up again after the new year, and you'll be able to register for any of them and all the other wonderful programs at Live from NYPL at nypl.org slash live. You can see all of our events and everything else the library has to offer by signing up for our newsletter at nypl.org slash connect. All these programs are made possible through the generosity of patrons like you, so please consider supporting the library however you can. If you have an NYPL library card or live in New York State and want to apply for one, you can borrow New York My Village for free. Or you can buy the book from the library shop and proceeds do benefit the library. You can find links to buy the book in the chat or on the event page found at nypl.org slash live. Uam Akpan has also offered some further reading, which you can find along with ways to access these titles from the library on the event page, again, nypl.org slash live. Before I invite our guests to the screen, just a couple of important points. First, real-time captions are available for tonight's program. You can click on the closed caption button or use the stream text link shared in the reminder email and chat for a live transcript. Second, this event is being recorded. The library values your privacy, so in the spirit of transparency, there are a few things we want you to know. Even though the video and chat are on an nypl.org page, they're hosted by YouTube. By participating in the chat, you might share data about yourself, which the library doesn't control. For more details, you can visit our Frequently Asked Questions page, along with Google's privacy policy and the library's privacy policy all available on the event page. Okay, our guests this evening will converse for perhaps 40 minutes. After that, we'll open the floor to your questions. You can send your questions anytime using the chat or Google form or by emailing publicprograms at nypl.org. Now to our speakers. Uam Akpan's interlocutor this evening is Elif Batuman, novelist, journalist, and critic. Her first book, The Possessed, a collection of comic essays about Russian literature, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her debut novel, The Idiot, about the daughter of Turkish immigrants in the mid-1990s, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Elif is also a staff writer for The New Yorker, taking on subjects ranging from stoic philosophers to COVID-19 with a great deal in between. She earned a PhD in Russian literature from Stanford University, and yes, both of her books are named after Dostoevsky novels. And she's been a writer in residence at the University of Istanbul and is the recipient of awards from the Whiting Foundation, the Rona Jaffe Foundation, and the Paris Review. Elif speaks tonight with Uam Akpan, a writer who divides his time between his native Nigeria and the United States. Uam's debut collection of short stories, Say You're One of Them, was a New York Times editor's choice and a New York Times and Wall Street Journal number one bestseller. It was named a best book of the year by the Wall Street Journal and People Magazine. It was a selection of Oprah's book club and won among other prizes, 
the Open Book Award from PEN America. It has been translated into 12 languages. The reviewer for Entertainment Weekly called the stories, quote, so ravishing and sad that I regret ever wasting superlatives on fiction that was merely very good. Wom is also published in The New Yorker and has held fellowships from the Black Mountain Institute and the Yaddo Foundation, among others, and of course, from the Cullman Center, where he worked on the book he will discuss tonight, his debut novel, New York, My Village, a satire and a history lesson, hilarious one moment, heartbreaking the next. In 2013-14, Elif and Wom were fellows together at the Cullman Center, and I'm so happy to bring them back together again tonight. Please join me in welcoming them both. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And thank, thank you, you to the Coleman Center to which Uem and I are both so grateful. Hi Uem. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish we could see the audience. I wish we could interact with the people, but we're just seeing people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but we're so happy to be here. Um, so I think Uem's gonna start off by reading. Oh, okay. Um, oh. Yeah. oh, hold on. Uh, ah. Hold on, I'm getting to the place I want to read. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you very much to the New York Public Library, the Coleman Center. Thank you to all our fans, Elives and uh, mine. Thank you, Elif, for all you have done for me beyond even this uh, conversation. And special thanks to our Coleman Fellows. Um, I'm going to read this passage about Chelsea. In this strange sort of intimacy, my nostrils picked up on food scents again, despite the deadening effect of fermented bleach. The strong smell of vindaloo washed over me, then of barbecue, then of oregano, then of saffron, dark and sweet then all of them at the same time. But a little warm wind diluted and swept everything away. And even this smell of nothing was pleasant because it cleansed my memory too. It reminded me of what it once meant to smell nothing. It endeared me to Chelsea. Brad and Angel, Alejandra pointed in one direction and talked excitedly about something called the High Line and how cool and crowded it was on weekends. Though I could see farm seekers moving as though they were floating on air, my focus was on my food aromas of Chelsea. I smiled to myself and tilted my nostrils upward like I wanted to inhale the entire neighborhood's freshness, till, subtly, the scent of newly baked bread nibbled at me. There must be a bakery nearby. The scent changed into that of cinnamon cookies and then of burnt chocolate. I think I'm going to stop there, Elif. Oh, thank you so much. It's so great to hear the, this book in your voice. <laughs> and, uh, and this is it's just a fantastic fantastic book and i want to reiterate to everyone that they should do everything they can to read it ideally to buy it because this is capitalist america but it's, it's <laughs> completely fantastic um so that's a great passage to start with um i think the first thing that i wanted to ask is uh um 
I have always found it hard in life as someone who goes between New York and other places, um, especially other where, other places in the world. I find it really hard to hold New York City and the world in my head at the same time because they both feel so big. And when I get depressed and I'm in New York, I feel like New York isn't in the world. Like I remember when I came to the Common Center, um, I was really happy to be at the Common Center, but I was really depressed for other reasons. And I remember being at places like walking through Times Square or walking through, you know, going to a Starbucks or being on the High Line and being <laughs> like, I have opted out of the human condition. This is like something else. This is like American, something completely shut off. And one really affirming thing about your book is that you read it and you just see New York and the world at the same time and the world in New York and, you know, the relationship of other countries and the public publishing industry, which is also very real. Um, and I just wanted to ask if that was like, if that involved, um, uh, if that was cognitively hard for you and how you pulled off this balance so beautifully. Um, you know, Elif, I wanted to write a book that had everyone in it, you know, let's just put it that <laughs> everyone. By, me, by that, I mean all the races, um, all the colors, uh, the vibrancy. Um, and finally, I thought about New York because my initial plan was to set it in Vegas, Las Vegas. <laughs> 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 but my characters refused to go to Vegas. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I spent a year in Vegas, but I couldn't hack it. Then I thought about Beijing. Part of the book should be set in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And I went to Beijing for a while. Uh, it didn't pan out. And so um, I'm really lucky that when I came to New York City, I could find my rhythm and you know new york has always been this place that is just too crowded for me mm -hmm. and i am a small city person um i've been coming to new york since 1993 i i i recognize i've always recognized the bronx mm -hmm. the bronx and, yeah and times square Right. Uh, other than that, every other thing has always been a blur for me until I came uh, to do my um, my fellowship at the at, you know the Coleman Center. You know, mm -hmm. suddenly I that is Chelsea. Oh, that's the that's the High Line, and I was just so excited I could recognize the neighborhoods. I knew what to do with the subway. I was always going in the wrong direction, you know and missing my appointments. Um, so I, it gave me the perfect milieu, terrain, you know, setting, you know, to do the kind of mischief I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to invite everyone, you know, black, white, Latino, Native American, Asian, you know, mm -hmm. everyone, I wanted to invite everyone to do better than yesterday mm -hmm. uh, but I needed that milieu and New York did that New York did that for me that's so beautiful I think one thing that's really special about this book and that's special about you is you're very funny and the book is very funny but not at all cynical which seems like such a special it's it's unusual and I was just thinking like Starbucks is such a big, plays such a big role in your book. And there's something, um, ah, I don't even know how to say this, but, but, you know, like if I went to Starbucks, I would go there and I would see like the, you know, fake kind of African looking stuff on the wall and think, oh, why are they putting this like fake Disneyland stuff here for us to have some kind of experience. But when I read your book and you have a character who goes there and is actually thinking about, you know, a Nigerian artist, like it, it made me realize that there's no way out of history. You know, you go into Starbucks, you go into Times Square, you see Elmo on the big screen. You're not outside of history. You're not outside of the human condition. It's all, it's all still there. Like, I just found that so beautiful. And, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm a Starbucks, I'm a Starbucks person. Okay. Yeah. I went wherever, by the way, I have driven to the 48 states in this country. Wow. So that's how much I love to drive around America, 
to enjoy this beautiful country. Uh, I have, you know, so it's important to me that if I go to a new place, mm -hmm. I find some continuity and a place like, you know, Starbucks does that for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lived all over Omaha, Nebraska, Spokane, Washington, Ann Arbor, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Las Vegas. Um, you know, I've been, so, so, but anyway, let me stop blabbing about Starbucks. You continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. Uh, I guess another really special thing about this book is the, um, the picture of the publishing industry. Um, and I know that I've heard you talk about it, um, in other interviews that at first you were afraid to write about the publishing industry because what, what you write is not, um, there's there's some criticism in it and I could understand how that would be really scary to do um and in the end you've pulled it off I mean I think there's so much that I'm in awe of about this book but you you I don't know and, and there's there's a note in the acknowledgments where you talk about a conversation that we had that I happened to be present at with your editor who mentioned the sad insular world of New York City publishing yes. And that's very true, right? Everything that people say, like, oh yeah, New York publishing, it is super white. It is like not very diverse. All of that is true, but it's also true that there's a real place for diversity and, you know, um, and there's a way of looking at that that's also kind of cynical. So I, I'm a cynical, depressive person and uh, that's why I like you is because you're not. Um, and I, you know, there's like, it's not like you're not allowed to talk about racism or being an outsider or genocide because no, you know, of course, Americans, we love that, you know, you know it, the, the publishing, I don't know why I'm saying we, but like, um, we're not, but um, in a way you're, you're really encouraged to write about things like that, but you have to pitch it exactly right. You know, it has to be like, relate. it can't be too depressing, but it can't be too, you know, a little bit of death is good because it means it's relevant, but too much death is bad because you get depressed and it's, you know, the, and you manage to write a book that treads that line in the form of a book about that line. And uh, I'm just really, would really like to know and would really like to hear you talk about how you arrived at that from the place of being kind of afraid to even write about this negative experience that you were having to the place where you were able to write about it with so much humanity and you make it so delightful that you can see, like as you're reading the book, you see how it got published. Like you can just imagine an editor being really happy about it. And then that makes you feel happy. Like when I read it, I felt happy about American publishing too, for publishing this book and getting it. And I thought, wow, you know, the publishing really is a place where these stories can be told. Like you make everyone feel good about, you give everyone a reason to feel good about themselves in a book that's really about trauma and the worst things in the world, which, you know, oh, yeah. hats off. Yeah, I, I, you know, when my first book was published, it gave me access to many publishing houses. Mm -hmm. I started having friends. So I would visit these big houses only to discover that these folks who read so many books and are the custodians of our collective humanity because exactly. they publish art that these people I felt did not want diversity. Mm -hmm. That I, I was constantly walking into white spaces, you know, white bubbles. And Times Square is very diverse and demograph uh, democratic. A world square is Times Square. Times Square is the world square. So moving a bit, you get into this building and it's all white. It was so disorienting for me. And what was even, but what was even worse was if I ran into a minority, the person was even more shocked to see me. <laughs> more shocked to see me. In fact, almost afraid to, to, to talk with me. So I'm like, ah, this means these people are voiceless. This just taught me that these people are voiceless. So I started talking to my white friends to say, do you guys see what I am seeing? 
why are you working in a place that doesn't like black people like us? And you know, many of them were like, look, when we would like to see change, but this place is so hidden, insular, and they fire and hire. Um, who wants to lose their jobs? So the more I went in the mind, like, okay, so even white people are afraid of this space. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I have been proven right because as soon as, as soon as Judge Floyd gave us the right to take our blackness, our diversity everywhere, a lot of these rank and file white people rioted, almost rioted in these publishing houses. You know, the whole thing of hashtag publishing paid me. And they were demanding now, because now they had some power, you know, to say, this is not right. But this is what I had seen 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I had been very afraid because from everything I was seeing, I did not feel the powers that be wanted this book published. Mm -hmm. And it's not just publishing. I was warned, I was screamed at, I was harassed for wanting to write about bed bugs in New York City. About bed bugs. Bed bugs. So I had a whole conglomerate of things that I was sure New Yorkers, those who the custodians would not like. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, unlike my first book that 13 publishers wanted, Mm -hmm. My second book, 13 publishers rejected the book. Mm -hmm. uh, this is quite traumatic, but I'm so lucky that you are referring to the lunch we had with Elaine Masson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Finally, I sat down and I'm like, okay, Elaine Masson has some power. She's the vice president of Norton. Okay. Um, let me go to her. She liked my first book. So she read it in one night and sent me a mail and said she wanted the book. She read only 70 pages. So I was very like, oh God, thank God, thank God. But I was still afraid. Would she get to page 300 and say, you know, get the hell out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Too many bad books. So one day I said to Ellen, do you need permission from anyone to publish this? Just let me know so I know how to prepare myself. Or maybe I should start praying. <laughs> Ellen said to me, you know, I don't need anybody's permission. I'm the vice president of Norton. <laughs> <laughs> so that I was so, 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 you know, so, so, so happy. Um, people do not like to be criticized. This yeah. is humanity. I don't think if you came to my village and wanted to really write like this about my village, my people would be clapping for you. Mm -hmm. uh, my first book about different cities in Africa. I know the number of African intellectuals who have been very angry with me. How dare you write like this about the pain of street kids, the interreligious dialogue, uh, uh, conflict. Uh, genocide in Rwanda. Um, so I was also experiencing this kind of thing, you know, in New York, um, you know, in New York City. Um, but again, a Nigerian American assistant editor at Norton picked this book and read and was so, so, so happy. She said, this is about my food. This is about how I see the embassy, this is about me in publishing, please. This is the book we need to publish, which again talks about what it means to have a diverse publishing, you know, force. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Elif, um, a few decades ago, it was okay for even comics to make fun of minorities. Mm -hmm. It is not that easy to get away with it. Mm -hmm. You know, because oh. minorities now have a voice to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We shouldn't be afforded for your own, you know, uh, laughter, your own amusement. Um, the same thing needs to happen in publishing and is beginning to happen uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, they're beginning to see now that 
they they need black people they need asian people they need native americans they need latinos also in powerful positions in publishing those who actually control the purse strings mm -hmm. okay so you know um i think also the question you had asked me before we came into you know this session was um so how did you write then about publishing without fear. Mm -hmm. um, it took me 13 years to write this book. Uh, it was only two years, three years ago that I created- Oh, the characters, yeah. Yeah, I created the characters I needed to dramatize publishing. Mm -hmm. um, so Jack, um, Angela, Angela. <laughs> Chad, uh, uh -huh. um, the owner of the publishing house, mm -hmm. and Paul Maher. So my task now was to make sure that this new creation melds with the rest of what I had before. Because mm -hmm. now when people read, they don't realize that these five people started being alive two years ago while the book had been alive. <laughs> 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 anyway, <laughs> I'm kind of curious about what you said about that things changed after George Floyd and it was things that you've been saying 10, 10 years ago already. What, it, what was it like just in the past year seeing things open up a little bit more, seeing more people realize something that you've been saying from before? What was that experience like? It was surreal, um, very surreal because some of my friends in publishing, mm -hmm. you know, they called me up because they also knew what I was writing. So mm -hmm. they called me up, they, um, they said, wow, when this is like your book. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing what is happening in publishing? I'm like, yes, I told you. <laughs> so, I told you, you know, I'm very, sad that this precious industry, unlike Google, unlike Amazon, has not opened up, mm -hmm. you know, and I have a stake in the writing industry. Mm -hmm. And it pained me initially that we have all these powerful minorities who have been writing fiction forever, mm -hmm. and you allow this to go on, and you don't take on the industry? How many awards you need to win before you, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't go that route because people have different gifts and they have done so much for writing all these people I'm talking about. So yeah, maybe I shouldn't go that route. But even it's if- It's interesting you know, though. I mean, the writing is a, it's a culture. It isn't a culture that has like all the individual writers were in our little pods and there isn't that culture of make, creating structural change in the publishing industry. Everyone's just, you know, working on their thing and- Yeah. It's, it's like, um, you know, sometimes it could be like uh, making a play, a satire about a dictator and mm -hmm. giving it to that dictator to stage for you. Mm -hmm they're going to finish you off first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, so, so I was very, I was very scared. But after a while, I was like, it is what it is. So yeah. between that and bed box and the Biafran war in my country, mm -hmm. uh, it was like every place I turned, I ran into a brick wall of fear mm -hmm. and panic because for 50 years now, the, the minorities, us, 30 minority groups, ethnic groups at least, we've not been able to say this is what happens to us in this war, okay? What has happened is the Igbos are lucky with powerful writers and they, as I've said elsewhere, some of them are my friends. But you know they write mainly from their own perspective. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people don't even know there were minorities in Biafra. And it's so fulfilling for my people 
now the minorities, uh, people in Nigeria, people elsewhere to take this book and say, oh, we didn't know, this is our story. This is now, you know, our story. <clears throat> and to see how many Igbos themselves have thanked me for bringing out this aspect of the story. You know, to see how many, you've read the acknowledgement. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. How many of them supported me in writing this story. Um, all of this meant I had to build very strong bridges mm -hmm. across tribe and religion to get people to be comfortable, you know, mm -hmm. to say, this is where our tribe killed your people. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. And, you know, it's a story that needed to be told. Um, the Igbos have suffered so much because Nigeria has never forgiven them. They lost, you know, the Igbos lost the war. What they did not lose was control of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And they are very unique in that, you know, uh, situation. And so my friends among them, they've been very, you know, supportive, you know, promoting their book, you know, my book among the uh, tribes people, you know, to say, look, we didn't know this happened here. Mm -hmm. we, did, we didn't know that happened there. Our parents were 10 years old then. They were not in minority lands. Mm -hmm. It's like the US soldiers going to Iraq and raping people out there. Uh, all of us are sitting here praying for US soldiers in Iraq. We don't know they are bullying people, torturing people, killing and raping. It's usually like that. Mm -hmm. And it takes humanity, a certain amount of humanity to pull back and say, this is not what we sent you to do. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was, while I was writing this, I was just very scared. I've never been so unset unsettled in my life as I try to tackle you know, all these, you know, issues. Mm -hmm. And to find a way um, to be compassionate, to create compassionate mm -hmm. characters and, you know, and say, look, it's not always black and white. We have Latinos, Chinese, Asians, Native Americans. We had all these folks. If you remove the white people from this whole picture or from this whole world, if you remove the white man, I don't think it will suddenly become a very peaceful place. But sometimes when we tell these stories with what is going on, because of the particular history of you know, slavery, mm -hmm. sometimes we forget these other you know, um, you know, these other people. So the book is to invite everyone, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, to, to acknowledging that, look, all of us can do better than yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think that's so beautiful. And I think it's a real, I'm so grateful to you for still trying, even though people discouraged you. I think that's a wonderful thing. And it's, and how wonderful that the book found these people at, at Norton, Elaine and the, the Nigerian editor who you mentioned that there was this, this way in, I, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, another thing, yeah. Also what you said about um, your relationship with Igbo uh, sources for your, your book is also so moving because you really show how when they're storytelling, everyone benefits and you, you really show it's not, yeah, if you, yeah, if you remove the white person, nothing is solved because the problem wasn't the white person or the, but the problem is these power structures. And you talk about how hard it is to see them and how being at the bottom of one power structure doesn't prevent a person from being at the top of another power structure, which is like a key thing theme in your book. Yes, yes. That being a victim uh, doesn't prevent you from victimizing other people. Yes, the fact that you're a victim does not... <laughs> It does not stop you or prevent you from victimizing another person. The contrary, the opposite. It makes you more likely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so I was, it was very important for me to bring this to the fore mm -hmm. and to, you know, to say, look, 
even between the Africans, meaning us who have just who have come freely to this country, mm -hmm. and the African Americans who came via slavery, mm -hmm. we are not able to get along. Mm -hmm. This That's such an thing, incredible part of the book, yeah. too, the relationship with Keith. Yeah, this part of the, you know, the slavery thing is still with us. Mm -hmm. You know, this, you know, the, the African Americans sometimes, you know, they feel we have come to take their positions, to cut into their quota, mm -hmm. because the white man doesn't care. There's a quota for black people. That's it. Mm -hmm. Whether you are from Britain or from China, that's for black people. Mm -hmm. um, but we also feel, you know, look, what are you talking about? You know, 20 years ago, it used to be African-Americans who acted any African roles, like Idi Amin Dada in the movie yeah. Idi Amin, <laughs> you know, like Adon Chido mm -hmm. uh, acting in Hotel Rwanda. We did not complain. We accepted <laughs> You know, so if our people have come here and also, uh, you know, better prepared, it shouldn't come down to this tribal conflict between black people. Having said that, I have to be honest to say, because of the portrayal of black Americans, of African Americans in movies, which is how we got to first encounter, you know, them in Africa for the most part. We, uh, we do not always, we did not, or we do not always, I don't even know how to put it, but that, that image of bad representation has seeped into many of us. Mm -hmm. And we begin to see African-Americans sometimes as lazy people, mm -hmm. as, you know, the very stereotype, the movie makers, you know, the racist, you know, writers wanted us because that's what we really knew in Africa. But mm -hmm. coming here and beginning to see that, look, it's more complex than that. For example, when I was in Africa, I did not know that American police could lie. You know, that you could have an autopsy that says, we, we've seen how this man was killed. And then the autopsy comes, the police autopsy says, he died of heart attack. Yeah. You know? And you know the other autopsy says is because this man sat on his neck that he died. I didn't. We didn't always know the American police could lie. We thought it was only the Nigerian police that was capable of this kind of, you know, thing. So for many of us Africans, it has taken us a while to unlearn what we were taught about our brothers to begin now to see that there's a price to pay for being slaves for 400 years. Mm -hmm. okay. um, because I know what it has meant every time the police officer has stopped me on the road. You know, I really speak with my very pronounced Nigerian accent. Mm. And that helps me. Yeah. You know? So I, I, you know, the more I live in this country, the more I see, you know, um, these people have not been treated fairly. Mm -hmm. We have criminalized these folks from the beginning. And yet Australia is actually a place where criminals from the UK, white people, were sent to stay there forever, like a prison forever. Mm -hmm. How have they succeeded? Sons and daughters of established criminals, mm -hmm. they have succeeded because the white world has helped them. If something were done for the African-Americans in this country, who did not come here because they were criminals back yeah. home, they could have recovered and we could have yeah. solved this problem. So I have learned a lot, you know, uh, my joy is more and more white people are beginning to see this mm -hmm. and beginning to have this conversation mm -hmm. and they may not always know what to do, but they will tell you, look, I've learned a bit and that learning a bit helps. They're marching with us. Um, at the same time, you're also having this incredible push towards white supremacy. 
-hmm. in a very strong way. So we need to build bridges. We need our allies in the white world. Please don't be tired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't be tired. You are, that your human instinct is very interesting, is very humane, is very needed for us to keep marching as white, black, yellow, whatever color, you know, towards, you know, this level playing field that has been very elusive. Mm -hmm. Have I blabbed enough? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's a really good point. Don't be tired. And if you are tired and depressed and cynical, read this book because it really works. It will invigorate you and give you new energy. Um, I know we're gonna move very soon to some questions from the audience. Um, although I have a lot more questions too. I mean, I would love to, uh, maybe while the audience is getting their last questions and thoughts together, um, to maybe talk about the role of the bed bugs and how important they are. It kind of reminded me of what you said about thinking in Nigeria that American police don't lie. And then you come here and you're like, no, these are the same lying people we have there. And to come here and find that everyone is infested with these terrible bugs, that you like it, it's so, <laughs> could you just talk about their role in the book? Um, if you notice, I'm in a classroom because I've yeah. just finished my class for the semester I'd finished at, Six, six forty-five. That's why you're on a marathon. You did three <laughs> yeah. hours of teaching, so I and have something to look forward to talking with you. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, I was just told that there was an audience question about the bed bug, so everyone wants to know this. Okay, um, <laughs> this class in you know this semester, I have talked about the movie Jaws mm. in this class. I love that movie a lot. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's about people have a desire to go to the desire to go to the beach um, in the summer. And then the stumbling block is the shark in the water. And the rest of the story is how they overcome this stumbling block. So um, I've always wanted something in my story. I could use as that shark in the water. And as soon as I got this idea of bed bugs, mm -hmm. I knew I was going to use it like that shark in yeah. the water. And mm -hmm. I was, I'll keep escalating, you know, escalating it till, you know, it finally bites, you know, Ekong, you know, at, you know, you know, you know where. Uh, and then I got to yeah, and just for people who didn't read the book, there's, I mean, the other, I think the most, a, a big audience favorite in your book is this character of Ujjayi, this girl who's born yes. in America, who's from, yeah. whose parents are from the same village. Yes. And at the end of the, the bed bug and the Ujjayi narrative cross in this very kind of, very intense way. Yeah, yeah. Because when you, when people have bed bugs, it's still a big taboo. Mm -hmm. um, People run away from you. People don't want to be around you. Uh, and you yourself, it does something to your self-confidence because you not know whether this stuff is in your clothes. Um, you know, but what Ujjayi has done is she's nine. She's beaten all over, but she still wants the uncle to come to the house. Mm -hmm. He is my uncle because he is my uncle. And there are many ways you can look at this. Do we want poor people in the US? No, that's why you see that embassy scene mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning, screening people, keeping people away from the US. Uh, look, at, look at this Omicron mm -hmm. variant of the box. South Africa, the South Africans should be thanked for discovering this, but what has a place, what has a place like Britain does is creating a, you know, a travel ban, a travel ban, a travel ban. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, is, we are still at the same place. At some point, Ekong is praying that he should be accused of having the same bed box Americans have. You know, that he's afraid they would say he brought the bed box from Africa. You know, and this ter terrifies him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, please, the bed box are just the same bed box that are biting you. The ones that are biting you, <laughs> bring them from 
you know, from, you know, from, yeah. I was able to make a lot of fun, you know, writing this and writing it in a very funny way, mm -hmm. um, writing about pain in a sarcastic, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, funny way, coming up with characters that make you laugh, mm -hmm. laugh and cry. That was my, you know, my main it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And it's such a relief because even just as someone who's lived in me, I've never read it. Anyone write about bed bugs like that. And it really felt like a literary innovation that, yeah. They won't <laughs> publish it. They will not publish it. It's incredible <laughs> to me, right? They, they're like, oh yeah, we'll write about the Biafran genocide, but not about bed bugs. Not about bed bugs. Keep writing no, about your yes, stories in Africa. Okay. Questions? Yeah, questions. Okay. Um, so this is an audience question. I love that the novel included a number of footnotes. I counted five footnotes. It seemed like there was so much that could have been footnoted. How did you choose to footnote what you did? That's an interesting question. Yes, it is an interesting question. I hate footnotes. In <laughs> <laughs> so you were generous to have five. <laughs> I, I hate footnotes in novels. Um, because of the nature of the things I was writing about, mm -hmm. from time to time, I wanted to let the, the reader know that this was not just my imagination. Mm -hmm. My imagination is crazy. It can come up with all kinds of crazy things, but you know, to let you know, okay, my imagination is jumping off this reality. Um, for example, my dear teacher, Eileen Pollock, after reading the church scene, which touched her so much, um, she actually went and Googled for something like that. And she sent it to me. Well, I've seen something like this online. You know, uh, black people took the cups of their, uh, the coffin of their uh, grandma to the church she used to attend, which is now a white church. And the white priest pursued them out, threw them out at the day of the funeral, funeral mass. And then the diocese, it's a diocese in Massachusetts. They had to write an apology, you know, to this. So she sent this to me. And she's like, did you know about this? I said, no, I had no idea. You know, I, my, my imagination is just, you know, crazy. And sometimes people try to rein you in. It's not this bad. It's not that bad. Mm -hmm. No, we are not like this. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down, calm down. This is why I don't write memoir. I write fiction. Mm -hmm. Allow me to write. I need the freedom to follow mm -hmm. one's imagination. Mm -hmm. You know? Do you know what, I, how, what happened to my mind the day I realized that Victoria's Secret had to shut down their shop because of bed bugs? No. I was like, what? Victoria's <laughs> Secret? So bed bugs has reached all these sweet, you know, things there? That's how I was thinking. That's how I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so at a point I wanted to come to be a woman, but you know, the woman and not Tommy would mm -hmm. not have allowed me to do as much mm. you know, with uh, the, you know, the bed bugs and Ekam. You know, ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm learning more and more to trust my imagination. Uh, <laughs> the footnotes are just there to show the limits of imagination and that some of these, that's, I think that's really interesting. Um, another question we have is something that we talked about also. You talk beautifully about the experience of being in New York City and how that impacted your book. What did you find at the library that shaped the book and at the Coleman Center? I found Elif Batuman. <laughs> <laughs> she always came, came in straight to her desk to work. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, I was so depressed. I was reading this book and I was like, why wasn't I talking to Uem? And yeah. I found Peter Holquist, um, my fellow uh, Coleman fellow, every Wednesday, or, you know, many Wednesdays and Tuesdays, we escaped from the Coleman Center and went to watch Champions League soccer at the Australian. You know, <laughs> this is how we did our writing. We actually had a lot of fun. 
Um, so just being in the midst of this great and wonderful artists and scholars um, from all over. Mm -hmm. uh, it meant so much to me. And it allowed me to actually live in New York City, experience you know, the different parts of you know, New York. And I've said it before, you know, my real landlord actually sued me and took me to court. So I was a Coleman fellow. I was also fighting a court case. Uh, finally, I made peace with him. He's a very sweet person. I apologized to him for squatting, subletting his place, you know, without his permission. I did not know. Mm -hmm. I did not know. So I apologized to him. He actually became my friend. Uh, so, so I learned a lot in... <laughs> I, I learned a lot in New York City. People were saying, you shouldn't apologize. You shouldn't apologize. It shows culpability. I'm like, I'm all Yeah, but I was thinking it's very un-American because it would say, oh, it's going to expose you to more lawsuit. And then instead, in your, it became this like life-affirming story, like from your book. It's yeah, a yeah. I, I, you know, I just said, uh, I just said, uh, look, sir, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't know. Please forgive me. I, so he grabbed me. And we sat down and the lawyer looked at us twice and said goodbye because he could see that the conversation had changed. And he didn't have a job anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> we spoke for one hour. He wanted to drive me to my place so he could see the apartment. <laughs> I had not, the apartment was a bit messy and I did not want him to see in that sense, so yeah. I, I told him to come back later on. We fixed the day and he came and we had a very good uh, conversation. So I learned a lot in New York. It wasn't always the library. Mm -hmm. uh, people like uh, Paul, you know, the, you know the, the bearded Paul who is now the assistant <laughs> of the New York Public Library uh, of, the, of the Coleman Center. Um, and a lot of, you know, the workers there, I used to chat with them a lot, mm -hmm. you know, all of that helped me because it helped me to see how New Yorkers see life, how yeah. they interact, um, the restaurants, mm -hmm. um, you know, the cubicle. Now yeah. you see me describe the, a, a cubicle in the book. <laughs> you know, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't a cubicle in the Coleman, you know, the Coleman Center. Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I should use this chance to really thank the Coleman Center. Back then, the director was Jean Strauss. She Jean was, Strauss. yeah, Strauss, she was excellent. She was excellent. She encouraged me um, a lot and always asked me, well, how are you seeing New York? How are you seeing New York? Um, and then uh, Maria de Ritney, mm -hmm. uh, whom I think now lives in Italy. She used to be the assistant director of the Coleman Center. Um, we used to talk a lot. Um, and then she took me to uh, Chinatown um, for a meal. The day she followed me to court, you know, wow. one day she followed me to court and then she wow. gave me a treat in Chinatown. Wow, so you have all the New York institutions. You have the New York Public Library, the court, Chinatown. It's like- Church and church. Oh, and church. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, I really came to experience New York and the, and the people. So many people, when you read the acknowledgement, you see, how many people encouraged me. Um, it's important also because my students always ask me, Wem, how do you research for your work? Mm -hmm. What should we do in the name of research? What do we do when we get to a distant community, a strange community, a foreign community? How do we break in? And I say to them, look, make friends, even here in college, make friends. You know, just make friends, try to, to, be, to, to create that culture of being open to people, you know, 
Um, because, so yeah, yeah. So we have two more questions that I'm gonna read um, that we have, I think five, five minutes or so. Um, so the first question is, uh, your new book, though occasionally similar in tone to your first book of stories, has a starkly different outlook. It engages in trauma while also allowing the protagonist joy and an ultimately optimistic viewpoint. Whereas your first book had an almost uh, universal, had almost universally depressing, if realistic, outcomes for the various protagonists. Can you go into the difference in writing the two and how you inf infused Ekong with such hope? That's one question. And the other question is whether you were reading anything moving while you wrote this book, which I assume you were since it was for 13 years. You must have read many moving things during this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. You know, when I wrote the first book, I, my main thing was to write about, to write tragedy. Mm -hmm. So I had made that stylistic, thematic choice. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, I boxed myself into a corner. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I did it. I, I intentionally wanted to write about the difficult things on my continent, um, different countries. So having put it that way, it was always going to be one dimensional, you know, in that, you know, in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to see the promise and the pain of our, you know, our children. <clears throat> um, by the time I came to write, you know, this book, first of all, I realized it's a long project. It's not a short story, but it's one long, you know, book. I try to vary, you know, uh, vary, vary the themes, vary the feel. It's been very, com it was very complicated at a point uh, with my editor, my wonderful editor said to me at the end, well, how shall we describe this book, uh, the tone? And I laughed, I said to her, laugh and cry and cry and laugh. Mm -hmm. Let's make that a new way of writing, laugh and cry and mm -hmm. cry and laugh. Um, and she, she said, yeah, you know, she herself was crying one moment and laughing another moment and yeah. staying on with, you know, the, you know, the characters, you know. Um, and I, you know, because the sense of hope is not only the, in the American part of the book. It's also the Nigerian part of the book, the mm -hmm. war we have been through. Um, and our country is suffering, is bleeding right now because we are mismanaging diversity. The leadership is mismanaging diversity. And they're coming in and killing Nigerians like no man's business. And the leadership you know, it's not lifting a finger to stop this. Uh, we are facing a very complicated, difficult uh, situation. I don't want to go too much into it right yeah, now. We don't have a lot of time left. I yes. just got a note. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, so what was the other question? <laughs> Whether you were reading anything moving in this time. Oh, but yeah. But I think what you just said also was really beautiful that this is like, it's, yeah, sorry, no, I'm not going to talk. You talk. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I read a book called The Idiot. Aww. <laughs> 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 I, I reached out to you. You sent me a copy. I read it. I Aww, read it. The thank idiot. you. I could not stop laughing. The Idiot, what a title. <laughs> anyway, so I read that. Um, I go back often to the Bible um, just because many times I'm in the midst of too much pain, too much pain. Uh, I need something to stabilize my spirit from time to time so I can see beyond this fear, this pain. Um, I need something to help I'm me. Sure. 
you wrote a book that will help other people go beyond their pain. Like you wrote the book that's going to do that for other people. And uh, I'm sorry, I just got a note that we have to wrap this up. I've loved talking to you, Uem. Everyone has to buy this book. And uh, thank you so much for this conversation. I wish we could talk another hour. This was not long enough. I know, I know. Don't, don't worry, I'll come and see you in New York. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you have to come. We'll hang out in the village. Thank you for joining us. For more information and to register for upcoming programs, visit nypl.org live.